while all education is important to me, this one is particularly close to my heart because uh, like Tom, I've spent a lot of time as a university administrator and a dean and a professor. And uh, it's been one of the most rewarding places I've ever worked and also one of the most frustrating, as anybody here can tell you, um, and many of you know. Uh, but the same principles we talked about in the first session about liberty, the person, the family, uh, religious liberty, uh, any natural organic part of society that emerges to do its duty, to do its calling with its rights and responsibilities, same thing applies here. And maybe that's one of the problems. Instead of what was 900 years ago founded um, in the first universities, we've gotten so far away from it where it's bureaucracies and it's thinking of itself as a different kind of profession than something very human, something very humane. And so uh, uh, Dr. Lindsay is going to go through the problems again as Dr. Bacolic did, and then our panelists will talk about some of the solutions. But it is the same approach to stress this notion of what liberty means to solve the problems that are quite obvious. And our different, our guests will look at the different uh, fundamental problems uh, that we face. So I would like to introduce Dr. Tom Lindsay. He is at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, which is, in my view, having lived in Texas, the greatest state-based public policy institute. And I can't believe I said that with my friends from Mackinac probably listening and all that. I know, yeah, second, second, I'll say that now, for second for Ben's sake. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and one of the reasons is because, like Mackinac, the, uh, the, the uh, superstructure, to use one of our Marxist terms, the thinking behind the think tank that made the rationale for even existing is not what are the bottom lines, how do we make the budget work better. It's about human things, and then we'll get all that other stuff right if we get the human things right about being free people. Uh, that's where Tom is now, Tom Lindsay. Uh, and in his past, he has done, as I said, university work. He's also a, a scholar that has written both for the general reader as well as the academic researcher about democratic education. What kind of education produces a stronger and healthier self-governing society? Uh, and he's done that, uh, like I said, in academic research as well as uh, popular uh, works. And uh, so please, let me turn it over to Tom and our panel for this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for that kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our panel on education and freedom. I want to first just thank Acton, which I have admired from afar for many years. I want to thank them for giving me the opportunity to come and be here at this, at this gathering today. We're fortunate to have with us, to my right, three distinguished speakers. First is Professor, to my immediate right, Professor Richard Vetter, who's Distinguished Professor of Economics at The Ohio University. To his immediate right is Joe Cohn, who's Legislative and Policy Director at the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, better known as FIRE. And to his right is Rabbi Mitchell Rocklin, who's Resident Research Fellow at the TICFA Fund. Now this topic that our panel will be discussing of the relationship between education and freedom is especially urgent today, no less, perhaps more, than at Socrates' day. Socrates can be said to have founded liberal education with his assertion, which he made at his trial, that the unexamined life is not worth living for a human being. Education in the Socratic sense is the project to examine our lives, to ask in the most serious way from the most serious thinkers, who am I? What can I know? And what is my relationship to my community? Now each culture, as we know, believes it's answered these questions. So the task of education at its deepest is to examine the assumptions that ground each and every culture, especially our own, in the attempt to replace opinion with knowledge, to rise from unconscious bondage to our culture, from our, to rise from unconscious bondage to our culture's assumptions to clarity about what it means to be a human being simply. And this is why it's no accident that the word liberal education Specifically, the word liberal has the same root 
as the word liberty. Liberal education at its highest, at its most genuine, seeks to liberate us from slavery to ignorance. Therefore, intellectual liberty, the freedom from mere prejudice, is deemed to be that freedom which explains the basis for all our other liberties, political and economic. Intellectual liberty illuminates for us the dignity of political and economic liberty. At the same time, the freedom of the mind or intellectual liberty also depends on our educational institutions being situated in a regime that protects political and economic liberty. Now, I raise these issues in my introduction because today, free minds, free citizens, and free markets are simultaneously under attack. More troubling still, the source of these attacks is our universities themselves. A failing business model, disdain for free speech and debate, and an abandonment of the seminal texts that teach us how to be free. This is the unholy trinity that, super, that superintends higher education today. According to one study, tuitions have risen 440% on average over the past five years, over the, over the past 25 years, four times faster than the consumer price index, twice as fast as healthcare costs. Now, in an effort to keep pace with this massive tuition inflation, students and their parents have taken on historic debt, which today at $1.4 trillion is higher than even total national credit card debt in the United States. And this in our country, which is fairly addicted to credit cards. Debt has become such a crisis that even the New York Times has labeled student loan debt the new anti-dowry. Now, as toxic as these price increases are, they pale in comparison to the dangers posed by the simultaneous decrease in free speech and debate, a project whose virulence seems to grow nearly every day, as do the number of free speech atrocities on our campuses across the country. In truth, our universities are quickly becoming the least tolerant places in America. The premise that the unexamined life is not worth living is being, re is being replaced by the assertion that the un-PC life is not worth living and that politically incorrect speech and ideas are not worth hearing. Our students are being force-fed the hemlock of censorship and intellectual conformism. Now, what's so ironic is that none of these campus illiberals, and I use that term intentionally because in this debate we are the tr genuine liberals, right? none of these campus illiberals seem to be able to glean that the only defense of their university's autonomy is that their mission is or is supposed to be the unfettered pursuit of the truth. Universities are supposed to have only one unqualified commitment, and that is to clarity. Right? Only this mission transcends politics, and therefore only fidelity to this mission justifies the academic freedom which is necessary to pursuing the truth. But today our universities more and more are simply becoming political organs. Right? And part and parcel of this politicization is the abandonment of a required core curriculum in the liberal arts and sciences. Now part of the reason for the decline in a required core curriculum is the national project that began in the late 60s, early 70s, which announced that virtually every high school graduate should go to a four-year traditional college. Right? 
Now, what has this resulted in? Well, it's resulted in nearly half of the students who start college never graduating. Right? Right? They never finish. And it's also resulted, and as we heard a little bit this morning, it's also resulted in a general societal contempt for career and technical education with predictably tragic consequences for both our students and the economy. But the, in my view, the deepest reason for the abandonment of a required core curriculum is our abandonment of a vision of the good life for human beings. It's the vision of a good life around which a core curriculum is organized and toward which it had always been oriented in the past. It's been said that today, college students can be anything they want to be, except knowers. The only virtue remaining in our universities is not the openness required to pursue the truth. Instead, today's openness is merely an excuse for indiscriminateness. So, question is, what can be done? I've raised the problems, that's the easy part. Our three, our three speakers here will offer solutions, and we'll begin in the order that we've presented them with Richard Vetter, and let me just tell you a little bit about him before he comes up. Richard is a distinguished professor of economics at Ohio University. He's written extensively on labor issues, authoring such books as The American Economy and Historical Perspective with Lowell Galloway, Out of Work, Unemployment and Government in 20th Century America. He's written over 100 scholarly papers, which have been published in academic journals and books, and his publications have appeared in all of the big newspapers. Please join me in welcoming Richard Vetter. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here, but I guess I should issue a trigger warning since we're talking about higher ed. We don't want you to feel bad about yourself or something from something I said, so a trigger warning is... Uh, uh, I'm sure the, uh, the Acton uh, Academies do not do trigger warnings, which is another reason why I would want to go there if I were young, uh, Charlie, you can tell your dad I said that. Uh, uh, I am an economist. This is the trigger warning. And we have, been, we have an unparalleled record of getting things spectacularly wrong. In 1798, the Reverend Thomas Malthus said that because of human passions, and the law of diminishing returns, humankind was consigned to a life of poverty, whereupon England began two centuries of unprecedented economic growth, largely because of liberty, by the way. In 1929, the dean of American economists, Irving Fisher, said in the New York Times yet, quote, the stock market is on a permanently high plateau whereupon it began the largest plunge in its history. In 1985, Nobel Prize winning Keynesian economist Paul Samuelson told us, and I quote, the Soviet planning system is a powerful engine for economic growth, <laughs> whereupon the Soviet Union promptly disappeared and no one today, including my drinking buddy Vladimir Putin, <laughs> believes that the Soviet central planning increased growth. Then in 2009, President Obama's chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Christina Romer, Berkeley, said that if we adopt the Obama stimulus package, unemployment would not go above 8%, whereupon we did pass the stimulus package, and unemployment promptly surpassed 8% for 43 consecutive months for the first time since the Great Depression. So you've been warned. <laughs> the price of going to college is, as Tom said, is high and has been rising at an unsustainable rate. 
In the mid-1970s, tuition fees average, we don't have PowerPoint here, I'll use what I call West Virginia PowerPoint, which is to say my fingers, <laughs> up, up. The price of going to college is high and been rising at an unsustainable rate. In the mid-70s, tuition fees averaged about 8% of median household income, 8% of a year's income, average tuition fees. By the early part of the present decade, they were 22%. <laughs> the burden of college has tripled for the typical family or living unit. Even though the nation was moving, although very slowly, towards greater prosperity, college is becoming increasingly unaffordable. For the first time in American peacetime history, enrollments began to fall after 2011, slowly but consistently for six years. And some early indicators are that they've fallen again this fall. People are just saying no to college. Markets are starting to work in spite of all the subsidies. The most obvious question is why is this happening? Let me uh, uh, discuss two explanations that are popular with university presidents and very, various apologists for the higher education establishment. And the first one is that higher education is a service industry that is highly labor intensive and not easily amenable to productivity uh, improvements, which we you normally accomplish by substituting machines for worker. Teaching is a little bit like theater. By the way, I'm in my 53rd year of teaching. I have 40 students right now. Uh, teaching is a little bit like theater. Uh, it takes as many actors today to put on King Lear as it did 400 years ago when Shakespeare wrote it. Indeed, with the possible exception of prostitution, teaching is the only profession where there's been absolutely no productivity advances <laughs> since Socrates taught the youth of Athens. Because higher education productivity has remained relatively unchanged, Tuition fees must rise, we are told, because we must pay professors more as in the broader economy uh, wage increases occur for, from productivity advances. Now there's two big problems with this argument. First, technological advances have occurred in teaching. Most importantly, electronic computer-based learning. 30 years ago, I taught four classes simultaneously at the same time on television. And uh, this has been going on for decades. But we uh, haven't fully utilized it, as Jeff Sandifer indicated in his earlier remarks. A second problem with the, uh, this argument is that most of the increases in university spending has occurred outside of the classroom. For example, on many campuses today, there are more administrators, uh, non-teaching professionals, then there are instructors. The instructional component of the budget is typically 40% or less at most American universities. Now, a second argument that university presidents love to use is that the state legislators are reducing their support. Appropriations are falling. There's a, a kernel of truth to this. There is some truth to it. But state higher education appropriations in absolute dollar terms are at or near an all-time high. And after adjusting for inflation and aroma changes, however, they're down a, a somewhat from a decade or two ago. And the, there were, in many states, including here in Michigan, uh, higher education appropriation reductions after the 2008 financial crisis. But there's a tendency to make too much of this argument. Private schools get no appropriations from states, typically, and yet they've raised their tuition fees almost as much as the state institution. And for all their complaining, at most state universities, and I, by the way, I've been ripping taxpayers off for 53 years. I know about what I speak. 
And for all their complaining, at most state universities, total spending is at or very near an all-time high. Now, this brings me to a third argument, one that I think has a good deal of validity, sometimes called the Bennett hypothesis after former U.S. Education Secretary Bill Bennett, who advanced this idea in a 1987 New York Times op-ed. Bennett argued uh, that the colleges raise their tuition fees to capture ever-growing amounts of federal student financial aid, especially student loans. Universities realize that after the governments made these loans uh, readily available with low interest rates, students would be willing to borrow more, uh, uh, borrow and borrow to pay higher prices, and they would pay the higher prices uh, since they couldn't, uh, which previously they found difficult to do. The evidence strongly supports this point of view. Studies by the National Bureau of Economic Research, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and others suggest that every time uh, the tuition uh, fees rise, perhaps 60 cents or more out of each extra dollar of new aid uh, 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 goes in the form of higher tuition fees rather than uh, just to the students to help them pay their fees. In other words, the beneficiaries of student aid are more the universities themselves than their and their employees than the students attending. There's, I teach the same thing I did when I started teaching 52 years ago, but the teaching load has been reduced by one third. Why? <laughs> Beats the hell out of me. Excuse me. Uh, oh, supposedly I'm doing research for the journal of last resort that three people read. Uh, from, from 1840 to 1978, tuition fees went up about 1% a year be, beyond the overall rate of inflation. Uh, there was a little bit of that uh, theory that it's a, a labor-intensive industry that had some validity to it, so fees went up 1% a year. Now they're going up 3% a year since the great growth of the student loan program. Uh, now, if the colleges are raising their fees a lot uh, because of these lending programs, what has all this extra money gone for from the higher fees? A large portion of it has gone to make life better for the staff. University presidents want jobs, want, who want job security want to keep everyone happy on campus. So what do they do with, with a lot of money that they raise? Well, first thing they use... Uh, to, uh, they give the professors low teaching loads and largely let them teach what they want, when they want, and it's often to whom they want. To help them, they hire low price adjuncts who do work hard for low pay. We give non-teaching bureaucrats uh, uh, good salaries and tons of assistance to do their dirty work Hence, the administrative staff at universities has doubled, even a correcting for enrollment growth over the last four decades, doubled. We try to keep the students happy by giving them high grades and reducing the work effort expected of them. Uh, and we turn them back, our backs, frankly, on their hedonistic behavior. We give the alums fancy facilities to party in while on campus, as well as some good football or basketball teams. We give university trustees anything they want. We ramp up fees partly to provide, finance so-called scholarships to lower income students so we can claim we are inclusive and favor economic diversity and whatever else is politically correct at the moment. Yet that game is not sustainable in the long run. As Tom mentioned, there's $1.4 trillion in student debt, and the burden of repaying these debts has become a huge problem and a political issue. The lure of federal funds led to huge enrollment growth, but with that has come underemployment of college graduates as well recent college graduates as well. We have lots of college graduates, one estimate is over 40%, who are 
underemployed, many living with their parents, working low-wage jobs, trying to pay down their loans. The oversupply of graduates, in turn, has led to earnings differentials associated with having a college degree starting to stagnate and even decline somewhat. I had a piece in the Wall Street Journal recently on this. In other words, the benefits of going to college are not growing, maybe declining a bit. Uh, the costs of going to college are rising. So why, why college presidents have stole the non-economic virtues of getting a college degrees, students and their parents generally expect a good or at least not a disastrous financial return on their investment. Increasingly, they are correctly doubtful that, the, that they will get a good return, so college enrollments are in decline. The enrollment decline probably also reflects what polls are showing. An increasing proportion of Americans are highly disenchanted with our universities. The disenchantment is very universal, but is particularly strong in families with traditional values. These families are tolerant of and even value the tradition of free speech and open inquiry that Joe's going to talk about in a minute. Uh, and, and even when some of this, that speech offends their own value, they still believe in it. But they increasingly despise the riots, the call for safe spacings, spaces, the sanctimonious demeanor of college presidents. They increasingly believe that the, the colleges are contemptuous, con, contemptuous of traditional values and even at some of the Ten Commandments. Uh, and speaking personally, and I, I mean this, I increasingly think that college presidents often do not tell the truth, <laughs> or at least the whole truth. I swear to tell some of the truth and some of the truth, so help me God, but not all of it. And it's sad to say I would feel more secure buying a used car from, say, a professional gambler or even a U.S. senator <laughs> than from a typical university president. So what should we do? I think a large part of the problem lies with the feds, a large part of it. The federal government's expanded role has promoted declining academic standards, higher costs, and an employment mismatch arising from too many students getting a traditional four-year degree. One factoid, in 1970, one out of every 150 taxi drivers had a college degree, one out of every 150. By 2010, it was 25 and it's almost certainly higher today. My Uber driver in today from the airport had a college degree. Too many kids of dubious academic preparation are going to college to maybe get a degree, but often not a good job. We need to rein in this federal presence starting with the student financial aid program. We should start offering alternative private ways to finance higher ed. One promising idea is something called income share agreements, where private investors agree to pay much of the college costs of students in return for a percentage of their post-college earnings for a certain number of years. The concept transfers the risk of going to college largely to the investor from the student, reduces federal involvement, provides us market information on the value of different colleges, levels of academic performances, and majors. States need to rethink what they can do. It's arguable uh, whether they should support higher education at all. But if they do, why not support students directly instead of institution? Give scholarships to students that vary with academic performance, family income, and ability. Emulate the, con the voucher concept we talked about, or tax credits that we talked about before lunch in higher ed. Let me use the Wolverines, this state, as an example. Why are there five public universities located within one hour of each other in the Detroit area? I'll name them. I'll name names. The University of Michigan, Wayne State University, Eastern Michigan University, Oakland University, the University of Michigan at Dearborn. 
wouldn't two or three do? Why does the state let Eastern Michigan University spend $25 million annually subsidizing ball throwing contests, better known as football, when similar and much better entertainment is provided six miles away without public subsidy in Ann Arbor at the big house of the University of Michigan. In short, higher education is full of scandals, built on corruption, and surrounded by sanctimony and enigma. I stole that from someone. But alas, my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Next, we'll hear from Joe Cohn, who is FIRE's policy and legislative director. Joe graduated in 2004 from the University of Pennsylvania's Law School and the Fells Institute of Government Administration, where he earned his Juris Doctor and his Master's in Government Administration. Prior to law school, Joe attended the University of Nevada at Las Vegas, where he graduated cum laude and co-founded the university's ACLU chapter. Joe? Thank you, Dr. Vetter, for warming up the crowd for me. <laughs> I'll probably cool you a little bit down. Keith John Sampson was 58 years old and a student at the Indiana University, Purdue, putting himself through school as a janitor on campus. And one day, during a break in his work shift, he sat down in the break room and read a book silently to himself. So not like former President George W. Bush reading to a room of first graders. He was just reading a book silently to himself. The book was called Notre Dame versus the Klan, How the Fighting Irish Defeated the Ku Klux Klan. And the book was a historical account of an incident in 1924 when the KKK came to Notre Dame's campus to demonstrate. And the book was about how the student body confronted the Klan as they pulled into the train station. And they did so to send a message that they didn't share the Klan's values. On the cover of the book, was a picture of a Klan rally with burning crosses in the foreground and Notre Dame's campus in the background. Unfortunately for Mr. Sampson, a coworker saw him reading the book and reported him to the university for racial harassment. Without a hearing, Mr. Sampson was deemed guilty of the charge and suspended from campus. My organization, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, or as we're better known, FIRE, we came to his aid. FIRE, as you might know, is a national nonpartisan nonprofit organization dedicated to defending student and faculty rights on college campuses. After months, and months of advocacy by fire, Mr. Sampson was finally allowed back on campus to resume his education. I should mention that he was only 10 credits away from graduation. This incident, which occurred back in 2007, is just one of hundreds of examples of cases where students and faculty at institutions of higher education were punished for expressing or even just holding unpopular viewpoints. And Mr. Sampson's case is an example that goes even further because it shows how simply reading about a disfavored viewpoint can get you in trouble on a college campus. It also, unfortunately, underscores how easily colleges will disregard fundamental rights like due process. So 
I'm privileged to work at FIRE, where every day I get to defend free speech and religious liberty and due process on, on campus. And I'm particularly honored to be here in Grad Rapids with you all today to talk about these important issues. I began my comments today talking about a decade-old case because it's easy to forget with all of the contemporary examples of campus censorship that threats to free speech at colleges and universities have always been in some degree of peril. And I want that to sink in because we often get caught up in the moment. These are long-standing battles and we will have to continue to have them. But it's been decades since there was any question as to whether students at public universities have fully vested First Amendment and other constitutional rights. In Healy versus James, and I'm going to get to a little bit of legalese for just a moment, and then I promise I'll stop. A case decided in 1972, the Supreme Court decisively held that, and I'm quoting for a moment, the precedents of this court leave no room for the view that because of the acknowledged need for order, First Amendment protection should apply with less force on college campuses than in the community at large. Quite to the contrary, the vigilant protection of constitutional freedoms is nowhere more vital than in the community of American schools. And the court continued, they said, the college classroom with its surrounding environs is particularly, sorry, peculiarly is the word they used, the marketplace of ideas. And we break no new constitutional ground in reaffirming this nation's dedication to safeguarding academic freedom. So as powerful as those words are, and as true as they are, fire exists because their promise is all too often ignored. It seems like every day there's a new news story about yet another incident of censorship in higher education. You've all read them. In the last year, we've witnessed the riots that took place at the University of Berkeley. At Claremont McKenna College, we saw protesters prevent people from entering an auditorium to hear Heather McDonald give a talk. We've seen the violence that broke out at Middlebury College, where an angry mob literally chased Charles Murray off of campus and even gave the professor who, by the way, disagreed with Charles Murray, uh, but had volunteered to moderate his talk, gave her a concussion, slamming her head against a car door. And maybe you've heard about an astonishing incident at Texas Southern University, School of Law, just a couple weeks ago, where the university president, accompanied by a state senator, interrupted a speech by Texas State Representative Briscoe Kane. The university president claimed that the event was not properly approved, despite a long paper trail of emails showing that the law school had, in fact, in fact approved the event. The law school dean, who was in attendance, has announced that he's investigating the matter in an astonishing development, a dean saying he's going to investigate his university president. And in the last month, we've seen the tactic of shutting down political opponents doesn't only target conservative speakers. And I cannot emphasize this strongly enough. The executive director of the ACLU of Virginia's talk, ironically about the First Amendment rights of students, was shut down by protesters that were angry about the ACLU's defense of First Amendment rights of white supremacists. And I, you know, we can talk about those details a little bit more maybe in the Q&A. Last week, Trump supporters donning Make America Great Again hats shouted down the Attorney General of California and the State Assembly's Majority Leader and prevented them from giving a talk. Campus censorship, though, doesn't only take 
the form of heckler's vetoes. For several years, FIRE has been tracking campaigns to get speakers disinvited from campus. We've seen speakers as diverse as Madeleine Albright, as Condoleezza Rice, as George Will and Bill Maher, and even this year the Dalai Lama uh, were subject to these campaigns to prevent them from getting a platform. And I've been speaking now for several minutes. And aside from my opening example, I haven't even mentioned university policies that have been used to, to stifle speech. Speech codes, which range from the kind of overbroad anti-harassment policies that were used against Keith John Sampson to misleadingly labeled free speech zones that despite their name are actually quarantines. According to FIRE's latest figures, one in 10 colleges and universities restrict students from expressing themselves on the open outdoor areas of campus to tiny and often secluded remote areas of campus. We've seen these policies used against students from every part of the political spectrum. We've seen them used against students who wanted to talk about Second Amendment rights. We've seen them used against students who wanted to circulate flyers about animal rights that promoted a vegan diet. And we've repeatedly seen those policies used to prohibit students from distributing copies of the US Constitution. At Kellogg Community College here in Michigan, a student was actually arrested while handing out pocket constitutions outside of the student union. The university claims that after they told him to stop doing it and the police officer told him to stop doing it, that they ran a background check and saw that a warrant was out for his arrest for something else and that's why he was arrested. That does not yet explain, however, why police are doing background checks into students because they're distributing copies of the Constitution and in my view, does not excuse the behavior. I don't like using phrases and describing these situations using words like crisis and, ac and epidemic, but the free speech on campus today is facing serious challenges. So even if we tone down the rhetoric, there is no way around the fact that there are serious threats to campus free speech that can't be ignored. I hope in the Q&A we can talk about the things we can do together to defend that crucial right. Um, this is important because free speech has been the driving engine of virtually every civil rights advancement in American history. It's particularly important on college campuses where we're training the next generation of leaders. If we start conditioning students to accept censorship as a matter of routine, and maybe even as something that's desirable, they will become leaders that wield it without hesitation. So we have to do a better job of teaching an appreciation for free speech regardless who is, of who is the target of the censorship. And that's one last point that, that, I'd, that I want to make. It is easy for each of us to call out our political opponents when we see them acting as censors. That's important. We need to call it out whenever it happens. But even if it is hard, sometimes we must tell our friends and allies that censorship is not an appropriate tool that it's not appropriate to say because they did it, we can. We always have to take the high ground without exception when it comes to defeating censorship in any of its forms. So I hope you'll join me in this effort. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the Acton Institute for giving me this opportunity to address you today and I want to thank you for hearing what I had to say. And I'm quitting a little early to hopefully have more time for us to get into Q&A later on in this program.
Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next, we'll hear from Rabbi Mitch Rocklin, who is a resident research fellow at the Tikva Fund, a Jewish educational think tank and philanthropic organization in New York City. Mitch has also served in the U.S. Army Chaplain Corps for 11 years in both the Army Reserve and Army National Guard, and is currently a battalion chaplain with the rank of captain. Prior to his work at Tikva, Mitch received his BA from Yeshiva University in History and Political Science. He's also received an MPhil from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and Rabbinic or Ordination from Yeshiva University. Mitch? Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here. Uh, I wanted to thank uh, Acton for, for the opportunity. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I'm privileged to work on at Tikva uh, is the implementation of uh, classical education and core curriculum uh, for students uh, in college and high school. And um, al we're also working down to implement it uh, at a younger age as well. And this is really targeted primarily for Jewish students, uh, students in uh, religious Jewish schools, um, but also students who are not necessarily in uh, a Jewish school, but who don't get a classical education where they are, whether it's at a typical college uh, or a typical high school. And so we host seminars uh, to introduce them to the classics uh, and to hopefully uh, get, them on a, uh, get them on a classical road. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, reasons for, uh, for core curriculum. It's, uh, it seems like we live in an age when we have to explain so much that uh, used to be so obvious to so many. Um, my uh, my uh, brother-in-law, who's also involved in, in classical education, was once at a meeting with, uh, with an educator from Harvard who asked him uh, what the empirical evidence is for the eff effectiveness of classical education uh, in uh, teaching students. Uh, and uh, he had to uh, pause for a moment to think that through uh, and said, I don't know, just a couple millennia. Um, but um, I do want to just discuss a few reasons why um, I, I think classical education offers, uh, offers uh, what we should be offering our students, uh, not only in general, uh, but also particularly right now as well. The first is it's inherently better from a humanistic point of view. This we've heard a lot of already. I don't want to reiterate a lot of what's been said. Um, but if we want educated men and women who are able to engage in arguments and discourse, who are able to think uh, Socratically, for example, uh, well, then they need what Socrates had. They need Homer. Socrates himself was dependent on Homer, and he said so. Philosophy is dependent on poetry. No one can make a cogent argument without an education that includes a robust knowledge of ideas. And not just ideas, but poetry itself. Poetry itself, as Boris Pasternak, the famous Russian, a great Russian author wrote, poetry is the sister of philosophy. And so no one can have an, a true education that involves picking and choosing from the array that actually built Western education, and all education, not simply in the West. Otherwise, we end up with stunted intellects. I think there's another factor when it comes to the humanistic imperative, which uh, hasn't been said as much today, uh, but which I found from my experience, which is that students, they want this. They literally want it, and they usually don't even know that they want it. Um, but I, I have not met many college students who don't want to know what it is to fall in love. And yet, the greatest romantic literature ever produced is not read with them outside of our seminars when we meet them. They don't read it in college generally. They read it with us. Dante, barely read in college, if at all. I had a couple small excerpts assigned to me. My students, generally, nothing. No La Vita Nuova, no Divine Comedy, nothing. And the students are shocked when they read these texts. 
They're shocked that love wasn't invented in the 1960s, or in the 1920s, or in the 19th century. Uh, Goethe once said about uh, his uh, work, The Sorrows of Young Werther, he said it would, be, uh, the, it would be the greatest tragedy if every young person did not experience at one point in his life the feelings that I felt when I wrote that work. And yet we raise countless thousands of students who never truly experience that, those feelings, at least not in an organized way. They may experience them, but they can't make, can't, they can't make sense of them. You know, I don't think any student wants to be a mere social being. Aristotle famously explains what it is for a human being to be a social being, and we are social beings, of course, in the way that Aristotle explained. But we're more than social beings in a way that Aristotle didn't quite explicate, and we needed a renaissance to understand this. We're also cultural beings. We're cultural beings in the sense that only human beings are both self-organizing, which all life is. Life is, by definition, that which is self-organizing from the simplest bacteria all the way to a human being. But we are different in that we understand our self-organization. We're aware of it. And we can make sense of it, and we can respond to it. And so we live as cultural beings to produce culture for its own sake. Our own freedom is the mode of our existence. We produce jewelry. Why do we produce jewelry? I ask all my students this at every seminar when I teach college students. Why do you think human beings, I first ask them, what, what, makes human, what do human beings do? What do they make that no animal makes? And they can't think of it for a while. I mean, usually give them a hint, they get jewelry. And I ask them, why do we make jewelry? It's one of, it, it's a question that on, on, on the face of it is quite simple, but what's the answer? Why do human beings make jewelry? It's this answer that we're cultural beings that's at the root, it's at the basis of classical education and a great core curriculum. And the students like it. They want to learn this, but no one has gotten them to even ask these questions before. Another reason that classical education and a core curriculum is so vital to college students and to younger students for that matter, I wouldn't isolate anything I'm saying to, to college students alone, uh, is from a, a traditionalist point of view. Both from a religious point of view, in a religious school certainly, but even outside of a religious school setting, from a, tr a general traditional point of view. You know, the, uh, the slogan of Google famously is don't be evil which, uh, which is uh, quite, uh, quite funny in many ways. But, uh, but we might say that um, really, we could use that slogan in this context, but really in the true sense of evil. But don't be evil in the sense that Aquinas defined evil. Evil as the use of freedom to rebel against the source of freedom, which still is the best definition of evil more than half a millennium later. Classical education and a core curriculum allow students to be free. And students really do, or at least part of them really wants, to be free, to be cultural beings. But the temptation to use our own freedom to pursue autonomy and rebel against the very source of our freedom, thereby rejecting it, is ever present. It's at the root of socialism, for example. And that lure is always there, it's been there for all of developed human history, it was there at Socrates' trial. It's been there in so many terrible annals in human history, and it's still here today, and it will never leave as long as human beings remain human beings in a world that is flawed. So in a religious context, classical education and a core curriculum allow us to understand that, and they allow us to grapple with that from a religious perspective or from a traditionalist perspective, if not a religious one. What does it mean to have tradition? Tradition is not merely the source of ideas that we get beyond. In the Western tradition, the Judeo-Christian tradition, tradition is a vector. It's not something we pass down that's static. It's something that allows us to achieve new horizons. We develop within our tradition. We achieve new horizons in freedom and better realizations than we've had before. The temptation is always there to look back 
in history and to try to eliminate pieces of our tradition that we find distasteful without realizing that they're the source of so much that we consider to be valuable. And so we're always in danger of becoming suicidal iconoclasts, of destroying that which we love by thinking that we're so much better than those who came before us. You know, it's, it's hard for students to understand a lot of the implications of what it is to get rid of tradition. I won't go into many details because I'm limited on time. Uh, but I think a few suffice. Um, there would be no scientific method without the idea of the covenant. There would be no Galileo without the Bible and a perspective on the cosmos that he's working around. There'd be no true romance without Dante, no Dante without medieval chivalry, and no medieval chivalry without the Bible. And it's not simply progression. It's the constant going back to the roots of our tradition that allow us to formulate new ideas. It's those couple millennia that my brother-in-law mentioned that is the empirical proof of the success of our culture. And if we need any empirical proof that when we abandon classical education in the core curriculum that our culture falls, I think we've had it recently enough. I think from a practical point of view also, uh, classical education is much better. Many of the objections I, I receive are, well, it's hard to run an institution this way. It's hard to provide uh, classical education. Then you're going to have to provide, uh, some people say, oh, you have to provide a classical track, right? I say, no, no classical track. Core curriculum. Everyone learns the same thing, at least for the bulk of what they do. And this inevitably scandalizes, uh, scandalizes people. Um, but uh, when we think about it, it's much more efficient from an economic point of view. It makes a lot more sense. You don't need to have a million different electives on offer. You don't need to hire all sorts of ancillary staff to cover th individual requests that students or parents make. And you can also avoid irrelevant material that really doesn't benefit anybody and that students don't even truly feel good about after they've learned it. They walk away not really feeling that they've advanced in any respect. They've had some fun, but they haven't really grown, and they know it too. It's, it's disappointing that so little, this is understood so little in some schools where the mission is inherently to provide a traditionalist education. Uh, it's almost as if in many schools uh, that are religious in nature, for example, there's a bifurcated curriculum. And if an alien came from Mars and took a look at the curriculum, they would see one half of the curriculum that's traditionalist in methodology and materials that's religious, and they would see another half that's progressive in methodology and has jettisoned the entire corpus, or not, not the entire, but most of the corpus, of the Western tradition of thought that was inherently intertwined with the development of the Western religious tradition. Christianity wasn't created in a vacuum. And Judaism wasn't created in a vacuum. So I think that we can ask the question of why are we facing this problem? What is going on? And what can we do about it? So what can we do about it is complicated. I, I certainly can't, can't answer that now with except for a very simple answer, and that is to do. That is to just implement wherever we can a revival of this core curriculum uh, and classical education in general. Um, I, I made up for myself uh, that I won't listen to any naysayers anymore. For years, I was thinking, how do we strategize? How do we get around these objections? How do we modify what it is we do? And I think the answer is to just do it. Uh, and whenever I hear opposition, I just politely nod and give a response and try to explain why I think we can do it, and then I do it. Uh, a colonel once told me uh, in the Army, he, uh, he was a very brash guy, and he'd risen in the ranks very quickly. And I, I asked him how, you know, just, he had, just for some advice, career advice. And he said, look, he said, this is what you're going to do in your career. He says, you're going to ask... Um, your, uh, I'm sorry, your, your superior is going to tell you what he wants done. And you're going to say, yes, sir. 
And then you're going to go do the right thing. Um, and there's something to be said for that. But I think that if we understand why this is a problem, uh, it'll allow us to think about what it is that we're fighting for and give us some encouragement uh, in the face of a lot of opposition. My, my father-in-law was a refusenik philosophy professor who escaped the Soviet Union in 1985. And um, he, um, he has quite a few stories from academia there trying to, uh, trying to get around um, uh, persecution and censorship. Um, but uh, one, uh, one personal story he, he related was he was at, uh, he, was at a he had to run to the, uh, to the doctor to an emergency room clinic. He had a, a small uh, fishbone stuck in his throat. They had to pull it out. So he's there, and um, the doctor looks at him and starts scoping him to pull it out. And uh, before he does, he asks him, what's your uh, profession? And he says, I'm a philosopher. The doctor looks at him contemptuously. Ah, OK, great. Starts scoping him. He's got this thing in his throat, really uncomfortable, can't say anything. And the doctor just looks at him, and he says, looks him in the eye, he says, we have lived for centuries without needing philosophy, and we will go on for centuries without needing philosophy. <laughs> yes? And my father-in-law, <laughs> <laughs> and he repeats, we have lived for centuries without philosophy, and we'll go on for centuries without needing philosophy. Yes? And he says, uh, uh. The point is that there's always the temptation to live without culture. There's always the temptation to live without rigorous thought. There's always the temptation to be a mere social being and not a cultural being. Socialism at its root cannot stand culture true culture, not what passes, not what we use to describe, not pop culture, which we use to describe culture. It's why socialistic societies produce drab, produce conformity, don't believe in architecture and beauty, in, in architectural beauty on principle, why it was a crime in the Soviet Union to dress too nicely. These are not simply economic considerations. They come from a core human fear of what it is to live out our maximum human potential. It's at the root of so many maladies throughout history. The fear and hatred of exceptionalism. I think it's at the root fundamentally of anti-Semitism and a reason why anti-Semitism always has been and always will exist throughout the world because we are all human beings. We're all covenantal beings we're all cultural beings, and therefore, we're, because we're responsible for the, for, the, for the end of the horizons of our own freedom, life is inherently meaningful. It's a problem for socialism. It's a problem for ideologies that seek to secure human security by, by controlling or eliminating freedom. Um, so I take hope in that, that this is a long, long war uh, but I do think that we'll succeed. I think the moment is ripe. I think many students in particular are tired of the offerings that they have. They want something. They just don't know what it is that they want. And I think that we have the ability to provide it for them together. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. We have time for questions and answers, but before we turn to you in the audience, please join me in thanking our three guests. <laughs> yes, sir, in the back. You, you, you are free to do that. I want to say thank you. This was uh, extremely educational for me. Um, for Professor Vetter, <laughs> that was the most entertaining time. I <laughs> it was very enjoyable. Thank you. Um, 
being a historian on education and a principal for a long time, a uh, uh, principal uh, educator, how far into your education profession, profession did you start seeing this uh, trend? Because oftentimes, uh, depending on your age, you tend to think, oh, this has just happened in the 60s or just 70s or 80s. Uh, when did it really start going uh, way off, or has it always been that way, and it's just more more in the media, or we as people talk about it a lot more? Thank you. Uh, one of the virtues or one of the problems of getting old or the benefits of getting old is people think you're wise because you've been around a long time. <laughs> it was true. I was briefly mentioned in the New Testament. <laughs> Uh, the, I spoke specifically today about the financial aspects of, of higher education, but I want to comment in answer to your question on all three brief, all three uh, components uh, of what we said. When I uh, began teaching at the university I teach at in 1965, the tuition was $450 a year. Now, in today's dollars, that's probably $3,000. Uh, but it's now uh, eleven or twelve thousand dollars. So uh, at the time, a lot of my students worked a good bit of their way through school just by working, and uh, their parents' modest incomes that they had were able to help a bit, and uh, it was largely self-financed. So uh, it really started changing in the seventies. And when we come to the free speech issue, and, and, and it has gotten worse since, when we come to the free speech issues, look, at the, it's been around from the beginning of time. I mean, in, I, I wasn't, even I wasn't alive, there was arguments in the 50s about Joe McCarthy and so forth, and on campuses, should we allow communists, should professors have to sign loyalty oaths before they could teach? Uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was a free speech movement at Berkeley and so forth, and a lot of demonstrations and some of the same stuff we're having today. There was a huge hiatus in that, though, a, a lull in that from about 1975 to 2000, 2000 or so, where there was a, a reduction. Let's call it the era of good feeling on college campuses. And I think the, the tensions have risen a, uh, enormously uh, uh, since. As far as uh, uh, what the rabbi was speaking about, the c curriculum has been going downhill from the beginning. Uh, when I went to school at a, a, a yuppie university in the Midwest uh, uh, in the 60s, in my Western Civilization class, there were 600 students. Everyone took Western Civilization. It was just expected you take Western Civilization. I talked to a distinguished professor at Yale the other day. He said, we don't teach Western civilization anymore. We don't want to teach it because we want to teach our, our specialty. You know, in 1830 women's literature, between 1832 and 1836, or whatever it is. And uh, we have lost sight of the consumer. The professors don't care about the customers in some cases. It's a shame. I'm in my 53rd year of teaching because I love my students, and there are so many of my colleagues who, for whom students are merely uh, the cash cows that keep them going, and I think that's a shame. So I'm going to teach till the day I die, or till they throw me out. It'll probably be the latter rather than the former. Better said. I would say there has never been a golden age with a lack of censorship on, on college campuses. And even in that period from 75 till 2000, yeah. that saw a tremendous proliferation of the speech code speech policies, code. of the written policies that administrators used to censor to stop the rocking of the boats. Maybe less of the cultural war clashes on college campuses, but soft, quiet uh, censorship against anyone who rocks the boat. Um, and, uh, and, and I think one other aspect that is driving this uh, is the continued treatment of the student as a consumer uh, to appease as opposed to the fiduciary duty we have to make sure they get a good education. 
even if it goes against their short-term, you know, preferences. Uh, and with that. Uh, uh, Dr. Vetter, I agree with you on what you're saying, and I have to say, um, I served uh, several presidential appointments under the Reagan administration in the Department of Education, and that was when the we came in right after Carter had made this a, uh, a cabinet position, and we saw how he f uh, actually civil serviced in five levels deep of his political appointees. And so therefore, as you started going south from the federal government and we started seeing what the labs and centers were turning out, we began to see, but here's the problem that I see, is that um, having been in there and seen that personally uh, for the last uh, few years of my life, uh, since then I have been trying to tell the American parent what's going on. And uh, we don't, e even the conservative movement doesn't pay attention to what's going on inside the classroom. It's always, well, if we get charter schools, fine, and then we move on, and we've taken care of that because we've gotten rid of the unions. Well, all charter schools have to be accountable to a government entity to get their charter. And so when you have that situation, you have some bit of control there that's going to go on. My question is, as you are seen from your perspective, you've been on the campuses now for a while, uh, are we seeing any of the professors coming in? I know FIRE has, has been there to stand behind some of them, but are we seeing any kind of an understanding that this is the war for America? It's fought in the classrooms, and, and, you know, and can we change the model? The second part of the question is, can we change the model of the university to something like the School of the Ozarks, where the kids go, they work their way through, they have a skill, they also have an academic education, and they don't have debt? Yeah, th there is, uh, on every campus that I've been on, I've been on 400 campuses, I counted the other day, uh, which is a lot, over the years. Uh, I think on almost every campus there is a, a, tr a group of people who have the same kind of concerns you do, and some of them are fairly active in vocalizing them. They are usually outnumbered on most campuses. One thing you, that if I can make two real quick points w with respect to your question. You mentioned the College of the Ozarks. There are a number of colleges around this country that are innovative and different in a variety of ways. The College of the Ozark, Berea College charges no tuition, tuition. Everyone works 15 hours a week as part of their assignment. Uh, the school has a billion dollar endowment for 1,500 students in a, the, one of the poorest parts of the United States. And the reason it has a huge endowment is because everyone loves the school because all of it's done. So there are examples of this. The other point I want to make, and this is a historic point, uh, the U.S. Department of Education has been an absolute abomination for higher education. Not just the, t the current stuff we've heard, uh, uh, no doubt Secretary DeVos talked about last night, the, the uh, Title IX stuff. That's part of it. I will point out, however, it is interesting that when the U.S. Department of Education was approved in late 1979, liberal icons in America with brains uh, spoke up against it. Sa Daniel Patrick Monahan was against it. The New York Times was against it. The Washington Post was against it. Why did they put it in? Because the NEA wanted it, period. And uh, same thing with the Morale Act of 1862. I'll go all the way back. We'll really go back in history. The, the land-grant colleges, this great romantic thing, it passed the Senate by a vote of 23 to 19 with the South out of the Union. It had been vetoed. I could go on and on. And the Morale Act was supposed to transform American life. The American life had been pretty well transformed on its own before it. Ever hear of John D. Rockefeller? Ever hear of Thomas Edison? None of these people went to college. So... I, I think people need more historical perspective. That goes to the points made here. Why, these kids today are all complaining, you know, tear down this monument, tear down that, everything. Ours is the only generation that ever had any smarts. And until they get a sense of history, a sense of, 
of, of, of literature and so forth, uh, we're in for trouble. And it's getting, it is not getting much better. There's some areas of hope. Sorry, I talked too long. Yeah. I, I'm going to just respond for just a second because uh, one of the things that I think is a positive that we're seeing is that uh, for all of the critiques that we may levy on student activism and disagreements that we may have on the merits of particular uh, forms of activism, we are at a time where I think it is positive that more students are engaged as opposed to apathetic. It's harder to get someone to decide to engage than it is to convince them of to how to change that strategically, whether or not they're right or wrong, substance will be on an issue. A real challenge is getting people to, to say that they care about the way the world operates. And on that front, I think that we, you know, students, whether they're right or wrong on a particular fight or the tactics they're using, uh, we should be nurturing that and trying to turn it into a more positive direction. So. Um, yeah, um, I, I would, uh, I don't know, I, I um, I'm much more uh, cautious about that. I, 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 when I read Alan Bloom's Closing the American Mind when I was 19, mm -hmm. and that was something that gave me a major realization that, that I had been, in, been lacking before. And um, I, I was older when I read Dostoevsky's uh, Demons, or Bessie the, the Possessed, but um, it's, uh, I, there's nothing more dangerous than, than an ungrounded ideologue pursuing something that he thinks is the right thing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm concerned that, I'm concerned that a lot of what we're seeing is, is the beginning of much bigger demons to come. Uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence that campus anti college campuses or some, some, of, some college campuses, I've been on some, uh, are the worst places to be as a Jew in America with people who are supposedly the most liberal and enlightened. Um, I, I don't think it's a coincidence and I think it derives directly from uh, from the ungrounded nature of what it is that's going on. Uh, and I don't think we're capable of pursuing ideals without a traditionalist grounding um, unless we're, we're going to end up destroying. Yeah, if I can, uh, I'll just add to that. You asked uh, if there are professors coming in who understand that this is a war for the culture. <clears throat> the people who really understand that it's a war for the culture are on the left. Uh, we didn't lose higher education overnight. Uh, if we win it back, and I'm as, as cautious as Mitch is, uh, we won't take it back overnight. First thing we need to know, and I say this from my experience as a professor and as a college president, and I share in common with Jeff Sandifer that I also uh, tried to reform my institution and was shown the door uh, as a result of it. Universities are unreformable from within, period. Uh, it just won't happen. Too often, College presidents get the blame for that, but that's because the average person equates the power of a campus CEO with his corporate counterpart, and that's not the case. The tenured faculty run the universities, right? So even if we make progress, we won't see it for a generation, because you'll have to flush them out, right? Um, you know, there's a statement attributed to Lincoln uh, that I've never been able to find, but I wish he had said it, because it's a great statement. He says the it's also a cautionary statement given our discussion. And that is that the philosophy taught in the classroom in this generation will be practiced in the legislature in the next. We've got 40% of college graduates who today believe, because they've been taught, that it's okay to violate the First Amendment if speech is offensive. We've got a poll just a few weeks ago that says that 20% now believe it's okay to use violence against offensive speech. That's why we're here. That's right. Thank you. Uh, I don't know who is next. Go ahead, sir. This is Professor Vetter. Um, I also have been around a long time, like you, sir, and went to school in the 60s. And uh, yeah. when we had Vietnam going on, when we had riots on the campuses, riots at the Democratic Convention and all that, and everybody thought that was the end of the world. And we go through these cycles periodically to study history, and each one thinks it's the end. And uh, most of us that participated, and I went to one of the highly liberal colleges in the Midwest that I won't mention, but uh, they are still quite liberal. But uh, most of us that went to school there got degrees in engineering or medicine or science, 
ended up going into the real world and learning about the real world. And as a result of that, um, did not do all those things. And that's why I think a lot of these young students will go through that sort of thing too. It's called maturing. We can't always predict, but we got a pretty good track record in history that many of them will mature. But my question has to do with the world I was in, we constantly changed things and we used to have silos, functional silos, like higher ed has educational silos. And we changed all that through lean manufacturing, total quality, and a whole bunch of stuff. And my question to you is that we, we really changed the, the, the way we managed all that. And to me, one of the biggest issues is this thing about tenure. And my question is, do you see any hope that that could ever change uh, to be a, you know, a step like I never believed we would have, uh, you know, in the state of Michigan, the right to work. I just never believed no, it. I, I didn't either. And when it happened, I was, oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> so I'm curious as to your opinion, uh, since you've been to so many colleges. Well, tenure, it, the statistical evidence is tenure still exists on most campuses. There's no question about it, and it's still a very much uh, an integral part of higher education. But it is declining in its importance uh, for several reasons, the largest of which is professors are too expensive. And colleges, in order to cut costs, so that I argue cynically, so they can spend more money on administrators, uh, uh, maybe it's for something else, Colleges uh, now have, I think, what, 45% of all instruction is done by tenure track or tenured professors. It used to be 70, 80%. It's, it, it is on decline. Some schools, new schools in states like Florida, which are growing rapidly in population and setting up new universities, are going to five-year uh, maximum contracts for faculty. They're giving them some element of job security, uh, but not all. Uh, a complete tenure. By the way, there are arguments both ways on tenure. I don't know that this is the time to get into it, but there are arguments on tenure. I will say this, as a controversial professor at my university who once had the governor of my state call a press conference to ta attack me, my finest hour, by the way, as a <laughs> professor, uh, uh, I must say tenure has come <laughs> in handy on a few cases. <laughs> And I'll just I don't want to add much to it except that, you know, F FIRE does think tenure has been very helpful, particularly in protecting controversial faculty. And uh, if you are concerned about the lack of conservative voices in academia, uh, eliminating tenure isn't going to help you. Um, you know, uh, so uh, I, I know there is sometimes a fixation with that because of you know, a professor from a, another political point of view who is entrenched in, who you, you know, wish had there's more power to get rid of them. But I promise you that the people who will be weeded out are not those people. It's the people with the views that you think are already underrepresented. So, um, you know, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I would only add that I'm less concerned about eliminating tenure in our existing institutions. I'm more concerned about removing the regulatory straitjacket that prevents startup schools from entering the market and, and setting the balance uh, uh, back. I think that's the way to do it, and that's sort of in keeping with the title of our panel, Education and Freedom. Yeah, you can't do what Jeff Sandifer is doing at the college level. Right. You cannot do that right now. The, 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 the cartel, the accreditation cartel, rampant uh, uh, conflict of interest among those people. They're all university people who sit on the accrediting bodies that can accredit themselves. It is, it's a crime. It is an absolute scandal. We don't do anything about it. And the universities pay the dues to the accrediting bodies who have, therefore, <laughs> an interest yeah. in keeping the universities yeah. accredited. Yes. Yeah, so uh, my question is mostly for Joe. Um, a little quick story, I went to uh, a Morrell Act uh, created school, Michigan State University, between the uh, years of 1990 and 1994. And um, during that time, a, uh, I guess I would say a, a fellow that lived across the hall from me my freshman year was accused of sexual assault. Mm -hmm. It was since dropped um, by the, uh, by I guess you would say the authorities. 
However, he was still thrown out of, out of Michigan State University for the accusation, even though it was never proven. Um, because of the Dear Colleague letter that had been rescinded by uh, Betsy, Betsy DeVos, does that inform towards what we might be considered better due process going forward in schools? You know, uh, so I'll be testifying in Congress about that uh, next week. Um, and, uh, and, and I think I'm optimistic about the direction we're, we're turning. Uh, shortly after uh, Secretary DeVos delivered her speech announcing the changes, um, some polling took place by, by Rasmussen, and it came out with results that were entirely unsurprising to me, which was that 72% of the American public agrees with her sentiment that we must uh, be careful to protect uh, complainants from sexual violence, but we can't do it at the expense of due process. That we need to think through two of those goals as both being serious uh, and important at the same time. Imagine that. Um, and, and, and the public is strongly, and it doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or you're Republican, the entire public, I mean 72% hold that very strongly. 6% disagree, and the other 20% was unsure. Okay, so I, I think in the long run, it's a battle we can't possibly lose um, if we can keep at it. And also, if we are measured in what the things that we ask for, if the things that we ask for are reasonable and thoughtful, and really do try to advance the needs of people on both sides of the coin. Because at the end of the day, I really agree with the secretary that uh, you want every school in the country to think through policies that uh, make sense whether a, a loved one that we had sits on one side of the table or on the other side of the table. We want them to be treated fairly and carefully and thoughtfully. And if we're not having that goal in mind, we're wrong. Um, so it isn't just about due process, and it isn't just about protecting uh, complainants either. Uh, so I'm really optimistic about it. Anyone wants to talk to me in detail after the program today about where we're at on that issue, I'm happy to go in real depth. Yeah. Hi, I was hoping we could get back to accreditation. You keep getting closer and closer to my question. But a, a lot of reasons um, students go to college um, for, for higher education is because that's their ticket to a good job. Without that ticket, you're not qualified for lots of jobs, and accreditation is really an impediment to um, new um, other or other forms of higher education. College kind of has a, universities have a monopoly on that, and I wanted to hear your thoughts. Well, I started to raise the issue uh, a minute ago. Uh, as an economist, I look at higher ed like any other human endeavor is an area where there's, where if you have a restriction on entry, where you have monopoly, you're likely to have bad outcomes because you're removing opportunities and choices for consumers and also the producers are more complacent and less likely to perform. Uh, I think this is a serious problem the reason why accreditation is, has such importance in America is because of these darn uh, stu uh, federal uh, student financial aid programs. You cannot give, get, your students cannot get financial aid from the federal government unless it's an accredited school. There's a lot of problems with accreditation, but one I think is pretty obvious. We treat accreditation like we treat pregnancy. You either are or you're not. There's nothing. You know, I never heard a woman say, well, I think I'm about 52% pregnant. Uh, you're either pregnant or you're not. You're either credited or you're not. The reality in life is institutions vary enormously in quality and quantity. Harvard has the same accreditation as nearby Bridgewater State University that most of you have never heard of. And so what good does accreditation do to consumers? What good does it do to the public? It does nothing. So I think we should, I think Betsy DeVos would be well uh, served to reevaluate accreditation. Maybe we ought to have a national test. Maybe we, Je I would love to hear what Jeff, uh, Jeff, dis Charlie, did your dad go upstairs or something? I, I'm gonna harass him about it later on. Uh, uh, Maybe we ought to have a national competency test 
uh, a very simple sort of little thing, just to, to get some sense whether the kids uh, who are very, very bright, like Charlie probably is. His dad tells me he has half of a college degree already. He's 16 years old. I'm picking on this poor kid back here. Uh, he's 16 year old. I think he ought to be able to take a little 100 question test right now, that including 20 questions on Western Civ and 10 questions, you know, uh, uh, on Socrates and on George Washington and Abraham Lincoln and so forth. And if he if he gets an 87 on that test, I think we ought to give Charlie a degree. I don't care if he didn't go to college. Thomas, what, how old was Thomas Jefferson when he, got, when he graduated from William & Mary? Do any of you know? Twelve. A little older than that, but you go look it up. <laughs> Wikipedia will tell you. <laughs> it's under 21, I'll tell you that. You know, I think that the, the, the idea behind accreditation, at least the theory behind how it's supposed to help, is supposed to be about reading out the fraudulent. Whether or not it actually accomplishes that is yeah, a different metric. Yeah, that's really what. And it I think that that's I think there that's is some legitimacy question. to that function. Right. It's just a question we do it very inefficiently. You know, one alternative that has been mentioned, and we'll see what happens in Washington, is is to uh, return accreditation to the state level, so that if a university wants to start up, it's a state. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll have 50 wonderful accrediting bodies, but one of the beauties of federalism is if things are so terrible, you can move, right? So that's something that you'll probably be hearing in the discussion about accreditation, which is on Secretary DeVos's uh, menu of items. Go ahead, sir. Thank you for an excellent panel today. And Dr. Vetter, you kind of just set up my question, so thank you. So my son attends Journey Academy here, the Acton Academy affiliate. It's his first year, and it is just so fascinating just to see the experience that he's getting. And it's caused me to think a lot about like, okay, what will he need when he's at college age, right? So that leads me to the question, merging kind of this morning with now, let's be optimistic and say that the revolution that Jeff Sandifer actually takes place in the next 20 years, combined with innovations in education technology and online learning, putting your futuristic hats on, you know, what could things look like 20 years from now? What, what parts will be so bureaucratic that they won't change? And what do you think you know, that landscape would look like, and then will that be better or worse for culture? Like, could it be better to not have as much, you know, concentration maybe in a given physical place of, you know, anti-free thinking? You shouldn't ask me. Remember my opening remarks telling you what economists' predictability uh, yeah. rates are. So yeah, for the others that yeah, are willing I, to no, do that. I will say just a tad anyway, and make a pool of myself, but I'll be dead and you'll forget what I've said uh, in 20 years. So what difference does it make? Uh, uh, I am moderately, I believe we are going to have a big transformation in, in, in education, in higher education in particular, and this does relate to K through 12, simply because of the, the economics is so out of whack right now. It is just totally out of whack. So we're going to have a revolution. We ha there's a, Joseph Schumpeter talked of creative destruction. And the, the, of the 10 top Fortune 500 companies in the year 1994, the top 10, seven of them are not in business in the same form today. They are either out of business, they've gone bankrupt, or they've changed. How many of the top 10 US News and World Report schools has changed in an iota? Zero. They're, the colleges are protected uh, by subsidies by, from the government, from failing. We need more failures. Our nation's success has come partly on failure. Resources, when f companies go out of business, is because they haven't done things well. They're not serving human needs. They're not doing what people want. And we need a little more of that in education. It, I think there's some chance it'll come. And we need, because of people like Jeff Sanderford. Uh, yeah, I, I, overall, um, there's, uh, there's no question that uh, it could, it could, there could be many, many positive developments from it. Um, I think that there is, at the same time, like with most good developments, there's, there's shadow to the light, which we have to be, be concerned about, which is 
the notion, for example, that, uh, that knowledge acquisition is unimportant because we live in an era of search engines uh, is not only, I, I think, demonstrably false. Uh, there are many ways to show that it's, that it's false. Um, uh, if you have, and it, it's actually dangerous in a way. Um, I don't know if you've seen the recent uh, smartphone studies about uh, how concentration levels are affected even by the presence of a phone that's in your bag next to you, but it, that is off. Uh, and that students who, uh, who have the cell phones out, their cell phones outside the room will perform significantly better than students who have a turned off cell phone inside a bag next to their, next to their desk. Um, because we're both social and cultural beings, we're affected by the, the modes that we use to learn. It's why for millennia mentorship was important and it's one of the reasons why knowledge acquisition was important, both because it forms the basis of our ability to think uh, as opposed to parrot uh, and, or, or simply uh, arbitrarily choose. Uh, that, that's really the difference uh, between a cultured person and an uncultured person. Both have the ability to make choices, uh, but one is making them in a culturally grounded way and the other is not. Um, so that's uh, something that uh, we'll have to figure out uh, as, uh, as times change. Uh, let me just add, you asked, will there be a transformation in 20 years? I, I think it's already happening. The ground has shifted beneath the feet of traditional higher education, but it will be the last to know it. Uh, uh, and that's always, I mean, that's always true. I mean, that's always true of any company that achieves dominance. And then uh, you, when you think about uh, uh, some of the startups that have uh, replaced big industries over the last 30 years. When it first happened, they looked down at the products uh, that were competing with them and said, well, we're much better, we're, we're better ensconced, but all of a sudden people started buying the other product and there was change. In a democracy, there won't be fundamental change until and unless a majority becomes sufficiently aware of the problem and indignant over it. That is happening right now. Even uh, Noam Chomsky, right, no friend of Acton, yes? But even he said, about three weeks ago, he said Antifa is the best gift that the left could give to conservatives, right? I mean, with each incident, with each atrocity, the average American who just thinks that college, you know, they want to send their kid to college, oh, well, it's the same as it was when I went there 30 years ago, and right? No, it's not. People are becoming aware of that. So 20 years from now, things are going to be different. Will they be better? I certainly hope so. They could be worse. They could be worse because, I mean, we've seen since the November election, universities haven't said, oh, maybe we should protect free speech. Instead, they're doubling down, right? So we're reaching a crossroads here. Uh, yes. Hello. Um, Dr. Vetter, as, as I was listening to your animated uh, presentation, um, I just felt like ha I had to make a few comments. Uh, about four years ago, I came out of uh, an institution where I uh, taught music for several years. And uh, I had very close uh, relationships with one of my students. I loved them and uh, really didn't want to uh, retire, but I felt it was time to and uh, the day that I did, um, friends of mine said, now, Cynthia, you really need to run for the board of trustees. And, well, you know, running a campaign is not in the uh, radar screen of a musician, which I am, but uh, I was able to do it and was elected to the board of trustees. I'm there to represent the needs of uh, the students. Uh, so many of them work, um, they, they go to school part-time, uh, they have one or two part-time jobs. Uh, students came to me and said, I don't have enough money. I'm sick. I've missed class. I don't have money for uh, to see the doctor. I don't have money for medicine. In the wintertime, students would come to class not properly attired for cold weather. Uh, so I've seen, you know, many years of that, as you have, I am sure. Uh, so I really don't have any questions. I, I just wanted to make a few comments. Um, at our board meetings, so many times the word diversity is brought up in our discussions, and it's also one of our uh, board values, our college values. 
And what I find interesting about that is diversity is talked about in terms of ethnic groups, programs that are offered at the college, uh, course offerings, um, lectures by outsiders coming in to speak to the student body, but nothing comes up about freedom of expression, critical thinking, diversity, and talking about some really important topics. And that's what I find disturbing in the colleges uh, right now. And I fear for these young people because they're our leaders of tomorrow. They need to be able to think critically. They need to be able to express themselves uh, succinctly. Um, and they need to, in a safe environment, to be able to express their ideas, find out what other people are thinking, so that they can formulate what, what they want to be uh, out in the workforce and as, uh, as fa uh, having families. Uh, they need to uh, be able to express themselves to, you know, question what their values are. So um, these, these are just my comments. I'm very concerned about uh, the atmosphere uh, right, uh, right now on these campuses. And um, I'm um, one of two conservatives on the board. When tuition comes up, I don't vote for the tuition raise. These students just don't have the means to do it. And um, I will just uh, finish by saying, I have been told when I voted no on a tuition raise, well, how are we going to pay for our programs? We need more programs. Uh, we need to keep our university professors. Yes, we do. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, are we sacrificing uh, students being able to get their education because of having to um, provide these programs, which maybe some of them we don't need? So uh, that, those are my comments, and thank you. I, there is one thing. I do think university governance is something we have not talked about today. And Tom was absolutely right. He made a statement that was brilliant, that it should be written. It's not quite at the level of the Gettysburg Address, <laughs> but it's pretty good. Uh, Universities will never reform themselves. The reform has to come from outside, I think, most of it. And I think trustees can play a valuable role. There's some difficulties with university governance. I wish I had more time to go into it, but there are a number of people wishing to ask questions, so I think I'll stop with that. But you are doing a noble thing by being on a board. Yes, sir. So in, in relation to um, tier three colleges and universities and unsustainability, because they definitely have a financial model that they can't sustain, what, what do you see happening in the next five to 10 years with those colleges, especially if possibly the accreditation issues could be solved and resolved to where you would have startups into the college and university prospects? 500 of them are gonna close. Yeah. yeah. And the and last question I would ask, it just, you know, I met with the college president of a, a fairly well-known uh, well regional university uh, last week, and we were talking about accreditation, and, and of course, Thales, we don't have accreditation. I took a lot of heat over that uh, before we had our first three graduates graduate, and they all went to UNC Chapel Hill, and then, then it went dead. Nobody bothers me about accreditation anymore. But, uh, but the reality is, uh, he said that based on the knowledge that he knows, he's worried that the Department of Education would take over accreditation. Why would he be afraid of that? Well, because it's more political. Um, and, and, and I think um, that, you know, Department of Education, for any of its virtues or flaws, uh, undoubtedly uh, has a political component to it that in theory when accreditation is running properly to do the function it was designed for, doesn't behave that way. Would it work better with the Department of Ed in, in control or with the, the regional accrediting agencies? I, I, I'm, you know, at FIRE we obviously we wouldn't have a position, you know, on that. Well, why do we need a Department of Education? Why do we need a Department of, I, I love Betsy DeVos, by the way. 
not an anti-Betsy DeVos statement, but why do we need a department of education? The strength of American higher ed, we are exceptional as, an as a nation in education, we call it higher educational exceptionalism, is because we got 50 diverse states. We have within those states, we have private institutes. We have 4,000, 5,000 universities. Why not, and that's a strength. Kids can go anywhere. Here in Michigan, you can go to Hillsdale College. Hillsdale College. They say the hell with the government. We don't even send them the data. I do the rankings for Forbes magazines of colleges. To get the Hillsdale da data, I had to call Larry Arn and Bra begging for it. And I got it, by the way. <laughs> but uh, uh, why do we need the federal government in it at all? Why don't we decentralize the thing? That's my uh, view. Yeah, I would agree. And I, I think, you know, even before uh, recent events, back in 2011, Bain and Sterling did a study and found that a third of small public and private colleges in America are in financially unsustainable positions. Why? They've overborrowed, overspent. In other words, they've uh, done all the things because they believe all the things that are driving us, uh, driving our economy down. So that's what I meant when I said we're coming to a point here where when these universities start to go down, then, there's, then there will be an attempt because the left views them as ide ideological training camps that they must preserve. There'll be, there will be an effort from the left to further restrict our freedoms in order to prop them up. So that you're gonna see a lot of that coming forward because a lot of these universities just are, they're really very, very close to death right now. Uh, take a different tact on this. Uh, Michael Porter and Harvard's National Competitiveness Institute identifies our educational system as one of the things holding back our, our country, right? He believes the only, or they assert that one of the only real ways that this is going to get resolved is by corporations taking an activist role. There's a company here in West Michigan that created its own school last year. They've taken a group of students from high school and have set up a process in their own curriculum where they're spending 20 hours a week in a paid internship role, 10 hours a week in a classroom led and instructed by the executives of the company at the conclusion of two years, for those that make it through the program, they'll be offered a job equivalent to what would have otherwise been offered to an entry-level management position graduate of a bachelor's school such as Michigan, Michigan State, and its uh, peers. So this costs the student nothing. They'll be two years ahead of their peers with zero debt. My question to the panel is in what way might the marketplace solve this problem for itself, and how might it constitute a set of entrants that f underwrite a new model for higher education? You're absolutely right, Paul. Uh, I've been yelling at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for years about this. I said, why don't you go into the business? <laughs> You're much better at doing business things than the higher ed sector. Why don't you do it? You be your own accreditor. You don't need accreditation. You, zero price? No, you don't have to worry about accreditation. I think that is one of three or four models that might evolve. There are some others, uh, uh, but that is one that may evolve. And I am very, that, would, that provides a, an element of optimism for me. Uh, by the way, I don't think the traditional four-year residential college is going to die in entirety. There will be a Harvard. When you're set on $35 billion in assets, mm -hmm. there's going to be a Harvard. Even without students, there will be a Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and part of going to college is is education is sort of this human capital formation. But part, as these gentlemen point out, there's more to education than, than that. And there's a lot of people who look at college as a socialization device. It's finishing school. It's, it's five gap years between high school and life. 
And uh, there will always be a, a, an element of our population that will want it, no matter how expensive it is. So I don't think it's going to die completely, you know, the, the tra traditional higher ed. But I think there's going to be a huge uh, move. And I think Paul, uh, my friend Paul, who, by the way, I met on the phone somehow strangely about a week ago, and I induced him to come here. He's from Grand Rapids. I never met him in my life. But... Uh, I think you're asking the right question. Yeah, fire doesn't take an institutional uh, position on it, uh, <laughs> so I, I, I I'll, so I, I'll, I will, uh, I will defer to other. Thanks. Isn't that the truth? Do I have to enter my guilty plea now? <laughs> um, since uh, I'm being turned to. Uh, Tikva, the Tikva Fund's biggest project is uh, funding uh, Shalem College, which is a uh, college in Jerusalem in Israel. And uh, actually, Israel's situation is instructive here because there, there is a stranglehold in terms of accreditation um, at the highest level for the university level. There, there are a handful of university, half a dozen universities uh, in, in Israel. Um, but below the university level, uh, it's actually much, much easier to get accredited. Uh, and it's still hard. There's still, uh, there are still some of the same barriers we've been discussing, but there's a tremendous chasm. Uh, it's not one accreditation process like Harvard at, and Bridgewater. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very different. Um, so there's been an explosion of uh, entrepreneurial uh, activity at the four-year college level uh, in, in Israel and also at the uh, pre-college military academy level where there's no, uh, not none, but a, a more limited uh, level of, of accreditation. So. Um, there's a lot that can be done. Uh, the country, for example, is much more culturally, politically conservative than, say, academics. Not, not a shocker. Um, but uh, the academic stranglehold at the top has pushed uh, intellectual conservatism in Israel down into lower institutions. Um, I the dynamic in America is, is different, but it's amazing what can happen when you remove accreditation barriers. Uh, one thing that I've, I've wondered about, uh, you know, for, for Orthodox, Orthodox Jews, you have an entire community in America of around half a million people, of whom almost none go to any public school through all of high school. Uh, and even most who go to college uh, do so in a, in a relatively limited way, either going to a, to a Jewish college or going to a local commuter school uh, and doing religious studies in a private, non-accredited school. Um, so it's, um, I, I don't know why it isn't a, a priority, uh, more of a priority in conservative administrations to, to handle this uh, and, uh, and to make it a top priority. Uh, to, why is it that you have states that are extraordinarily conservative uh, that are not dealing with the fact that they have institutions that they're funding that are completely and totally out of sync uh, with what their voters want to support? I don't know the answer to it. I would agree. I, I think rather than wait 10 or 20 years to see if the Bain and Sterling prediction about a third of schools going bankrupt comes true or not, if businesses we're, start, we're to start to accept graduates of programs like Jeff Sandifer's, that would end. Accreditation really would be irrelevant, right? right? It's only because business, now why does business do that? Up until 1970, a lot of businesses relied on aptitude. You had to take an aptitude test when you apply for the job, but there was a Supreme Court case, Duke versus Griggs Power, which found that that was a violation, that that, was, that produced racially disproportionate results. So, to cover themselves, businesses now insist on a transcript, even though they've been telling me for 20 years that transcripts are virtually meaningless because everybody has A's and B's, right? You know, I've changed my mind. <laughs> um, I reserve the right to do that. Every now, and now every now and then. Fire now has a position. No, we, 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 we still don't, but, 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 part of, but part of the, uh, part of the conversation um, ha has also evolved into, you know, what is the value of higher ed as a broad, you know, bigger picture question. Um, and, and I'm going to defend it for a moment um, while saying, while there are obviously serious criticisms to levy against aspects of higher education now, we are better off as a society where we are now, where more people are getting more education than we were if everyone quit at the end of high school and did things. Now, I don't want to create a false exchange of either do nothing or, 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 
or what have you. There's plenty of room for improvement under the current status quo. But I very strongly worry about the idea and phrasing of the question of why don't we get state legislatures to crack down on it based on the politics of their states. The last thing I want is to be politicizing you know, how education is run. Um, while on the margins, you obviously have to do some to keep people in sanity and insane lanes. Um, in, not insane as in one word, but <laughs> insane as in two words, uh, lanes. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, so that, that worries me a great deal as someone who works with legislators every day. Uh, so anyway. I, 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 to, I don't, I, I disagree. I, I think, uh, because I think it's already politicized, and I think if we pretend like it's not, or that, or that we can, it, it just is, um, and it is—it's not just politicized. It's so thoroughly politicized that what we have is a situation where you have public funding for institutions that are against the very mission that they're supposed to be fulfilling in the public interest, and they're against the public itself. Now we have a First Amendment, but the First Amendment doesn't require us to fund institutions that are, that are hostile to ourselves, number one, and number two, in terms of whether it's good to do so. Yeah, I, I just, I don't agree, I, I've taught in, in public universities for, for eight years, um, and I don't know that, that we're giving our students substantial education, I, and I don't think it has to be a question of either or, meaning either we have uh, the status quo or we, we defund, no, defunding is a good way to create creative destruction. And, and, I, and I think that part of the problem is our public institutions, our, our colleges and universities, are not responsible to the public at all. Now, I shouldn't say at all, that's extreme, but they're largely not. Uh, and so if you look at uh, what they've become, they've become so thoroughly politicized. Uh, I, I have countless friends who are conservatives who wanted to go into academia who cannot get through. They gave up and they just left. Uh, I've experienced the same kind of hostility. And, um, and so, yeah, tenure protects one in every, you know, one in 20 can, can be conservative, I if that. Um, but I think we should, I, I think we should, we should just change our, our, our minds. I, I think it's a lost cause unless we engage in drastic action. There are always dangers to drastic action, but I think if we do nothing, we're, we're already in hell, so to speak. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that the, I mean, I think that the concern is that that becomes more of a question of which hell as opposed to in hell or not when you start in interjecting too much control at the legislative level into the functioning of institutions, uh, you are inviting not just the kind of politicization in terms of do we agree with the structure of the school or not, you start getting into the questions of what can and can't be taught, how things can and can't be taught, et cetera, and, 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 and it becomes a really destructive kind of discussion that eviscerates how academic freedom is about to unfold. And that's not to say that I don't agree with you on some of the criticisms and charges of the status quo that exist now, but there are lighter interventions that could be meaningful. Well, my I think the question is, which government official decides what is and is not taught? Because right now, the status quo is, there are government <laughs> officials making those decisions, uh, and on a basis that's against the higher government officials not who appropriate, who appropriate the that, money. That is not true in higher ed. That is not a, true. A department head at a public college is a government official. We're going to have to. From we've a got a few more questions, <laughs> so well, we can continue this afterwards. <laughs> we continue this. I would only add. I mean, it's come down, and this could be an alternative. This could be the subtitle of our panel. Question that's come down to is this: Are American taxpayers required to subsidize the destruction of their country and their way of life? <laughs> yes, sir. I was just going to make a comment in terms of if we think about higher ed as a supply chain um, into the marketplace. When I was at Loyola University, we were interviewing for a new dean in the business school. One of the candidates had come from Northwestern University, and, and they said they studied every criteria that they could find to determine what impact they were having on their students and their career success. And what they discovered was the only thing that they could find correlated with success after graduating was the score on the candidate's entrance interview. And the conclusion that they reached was they became an effic efficient market mechanism for, for filtering out and finding talent for business. And so I believe that's an, a, a, that could become a catalyst when we look at the cost of higher ed and how much value is either being added or not being added. At what point will business seek to solve this problem for itself? Well and nullify these arguments of politics and, yeah. and, and policy. Here, here. Uh, 
Um, I've got two parts to my question, and the first part is um, Common Core is not just K through 12, it also goes into regulating what's going on in the colleges, et cetera. Um, so there is that, let's face it, I, I've known people who teach on the college level who say, I went to the college, I had this course already constructed and stuff, but I was told that I had to use this curriculum, et cetera, et cetera, and it was mandated, even though that curriculum was totally in era of the subject that they're teaching. Now, my question is, what would it take to have a new accrediting agency that would be more conservative, academically accurate, and uh, have the ability to uh, be able to accredit new universities that are struggling? I have a friend of mine who uh, is in New York City, New York Divinity School. He's been trying to get his uh, seminary uh, accredited for years. It's been, it's been absolutely crazy. What would it take to establish a new accrediting agency that would be able to have uh, the ability to uh, recognize degrees that are legitimate, rigorous, and um, truthful? There was an attempt, by the way. We had, Tom, Tom probably knows more than I do about this, but there was indeed an accreditation agency that was very liberal arts oriented that was uh, essentially killed. Yes, the American Academy for Liberal Education. It was an attempt to do exactly what you say. The, the issue is who should be, who should accredit the accreditors? Uh, I, I, that's true. I mean, that, that, that's exactly, that's right. there's an, org, I could, there's a politics, so there's something called NICWICI, is it? NICWICI? There's an advisory group to the U.S. Yes. Department of Education that is in charge of this, and there have been conservatives on that group who have been yelling and screaming for years, Ann Neal, for example, of ACTA. Uh, but you're right, why do we need, why can't we just form any kind, why can't the states form an accreditation group and just tell, uh, and then tell their uh, congressmen and all, you will get behind this politically or, you know, you're toast. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there are ways. I used to work for Congress. There are ways these things can be worked out, uh, but we don't do it. The, the, the problem that my friend was having was yeah. the state of New York Department of Education oh, itself. Oh, God. Well, his problem is he lives in the state of New York. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me make a quick note here. Uh, we've got about 10 more minutes. Uh, these two will be the last ones. Uh, besides me, because I'm going to exercise the privilege of the convener, uh, because I think this accreditation issue gets to the heart of every single freedom issue we're talking about. And I want to, as someone who's taken institutions through the reviews, I've sat on the review boards, I was with AALE through a review, Richard, yeah. um, and, and they failed for lack of money, but it wasn't just because they couldn't find money, it's because the way the system worked, no one wanted to go through their accreditation and pay them because they knew the authorities in Washington weren't very sympathetic to them. Um, for those who don't know, and Richard mentioned this, accreditation is done, the foxes are ruling the hen house. It is people who have a vested interest in the system changing, not at all, who have, shall we say, hostile points of view about uh, how you educate someone, and not just against conservatives, or it happens that way. Anybody who looks at a book that's older than 10 minutes, they don't like you. The latest review article is what we're doing in education, not something, you know, you people talking about Aristotle and Plato, who cares, you're crazy. That's not where they are, and that's what AALE was uh, trying to address. But there is a, uh, a plan. It's been in the works for years, and I talked with Secretary DeVos about this in the past. Senator Mike Lee has a bill, some of you are familiar, shaking your heads, which essentially says that the states, the governors, the legislatures may determine what is an accredited program in their state. And then Betsy has to give the federal dollars to the students who are going into those programs. The Department of Education can't say, no, no, we don't like that. So Senator Lee's uh, law would change the system now, which says, if you expect to get federal dollars from a student in your university, your college or university, it will be accredited by the six regional accreditors, which is all made up of, excuse me, if you have one, an EDD type person. I don't dislike all people with EDDs, but that is the bulk of the pe people that are in these organizations and they have a particular mindset. And so here's the beauty of it. 
if the bill passes, the, uh, the ability for Acton Institute and Steelcase up the road to sit together and say, we have an ideal academic program that serves a need in the community, we will administer it, and the state of Michigan says, that looks pretty good to us, you're preparing people the right way. And lest my friend Mitch or anybody else, because I am as wedded to classical liberal arts education as anybody, there will be plenty of steel cases and actants who will work together and say, well, first we have to make sure they're literate and numerate and that they have all the soft skills and that they know how to fall in love. It's a great thing to do. Dante, Shakespeare, and all of that. And you put all that together because people in corporations and businesses know you need to be a thinking, feeling person as well as have skills. So I think there is an answer. And, and, uh, and I think that the likelihood of any other Secretary of Education making that bill work, uh, this is the one to do it. So, all right, you two and I'll shut up. Yeah, I'll walk you through a quick thing. I graduated from college in 1981. I don't remember any professor um, in my college ever berating a president or the politics of what was going on at the time. That, that was not part of my college education. Um, in 2001, my oldest son went to school and his freshman composition class, he was required to write an essay um, comparing nakedness and nudity complete with all the pictures. Um, in uh, 2006, I went to, no, yeah, 2006, I went to a local um, state college here where I took a logic class and on the first day of class we were learning about objections and um, he dismantled the Ten Commandments um, before the first hour was done and I thought, okay, this is going to be a great Great time. The, the thing I see interjecting all the time is this um, politics. We can't talk about ideas anymore. We just talk about politics. So Rabbi, one of the things I heard when you talked was that by bringing up the classics out of our century, out of our time, that that becomes a way to talk about some of the great ideas that make us all human, that's outside the business area. And I would really like you to talk about the necessary and the necessity to be human souls. Um, yeah, it's, um, in uh, Charles Dickens' novel, uh, Little Dorrit, there's a, uh, there's a department of circumlocution uh, in the British government, which, uh, if you haven't read the book, serves to circumlocute things, uh, and uh, it's um, there's the uh, there's also the, uh, the the soulless machine in that in that novel also. Um, I, I think that um, we have we have lost a um, we've lost sight of of what education is supposed to be. Education is not merely about vocation. Um, and it's precisely for that reason why I, I actually, I, I, I agree that it is problematic to have government making political decisions about what, what is taught. I just see the department chair at a college in the City University of New York as a powerful government official in the same way that I think a higher government official is powerful. And, and in fact, I actually think he's a more powerful government official in a way because he's not really accountable. And, and I've seen this with department heads all the time. And my, my, my friends in academia have seen it all the time. Good luck challenging a decision made in an academic department. There are things you can do. Egregious offenses. There are great organizations like FIRE that, that are doing amazing, amazing work challenging illegal and unconstitutional bias. Uh, but it, it, the, 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 the culture um, of, these, of these institutions and the setup is such that it's very, very difficult uh, to gain an education uh, for your human soul. And, and I don't think that we should just tear it all down, you know, destroy it all. I do think there are many positive things. I'm not saying, you know, we should be, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be, uh, uh, you know, just, just to say burn it all down, so to speak. Um, but, but I do think that, um, I do think that, that, that the more that we can consider in terms, I, 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 I agree with, um, with, uh, with, with Tom that, um, we're subsidizing our own cultural destruction and the destruction of our own souls. What Alan Bloom writes about in The Closing of the American Mind, and to the extent that we don't need to. I think there are con perfectly constitutional and legal 
recourses that we can undertake uh, to, 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 to not do that anymore. So I think that all three of us at the table, and I'll add uh, Tom as well at the podium, uh, and probably most of the people in this room want to have intellectual diversity uh, of faculty and want to have intellectual diversity of programs uh, and want students from diverse political perspectives to feel like they have a fair shake and get a good and solid education. So the question is how to go about getting that. You know, one of the mindsets and one of the approaches, which I hear all of the time, is to pick out the particularly egregiously shocking, you know, offensive example of, uh, of, 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 of teaching that we see and maybe intolerance from a, from a faculty member and maybe even a lack of accountability within the department uh, and say, how do we get our higher officials to crack down on that? That's one approach. And the other approach, which I, which I think is, has a much stronger basis in the history of succeeding, is to provide actual really robust academic freedom that really does protect the minority viewpoint. And then also to make a commitment to try to hire people from those different viewpoints. And one of the reasons why they don't, why a lot of uh, conservative people don't try to pursue careers in higher education is because they think that they will be weeded out pretty quickly, uh, you know, and, and, and be cracked down upon. Conferring the authority on, uh, on, on, on elected officials, I, I fear doesn't actually advance the ball there, except in the short run of the composition of the legislature, which we cannot, without, without crystal balls, predict how it will be forever and ever. So when we set the norms, um, you know, I, I think you call out the bad actors at the, at the lower levels and in, and in schools when they are not really being responsive uh, and being fair to minority viewpoints. And, uh, and you know, I, I'm working hard on legislation to give minority viewpoints the tools to, to defend themselves, too. But that requires also tolerating the really offensive on, on the other yeah, side on sometimes. The other side. Uh, because they find your views reprehensible, backwards, Neanderthalic, every kind of adjective you want to describe, I'm sure they would describe your views in those ways, too. So, um, so, so we need to be careful about not allowing those projections of the, of the other to be what dis determines how the how the politics will come from on high. That's, that's I guess, where I, where I would fall. Um, so I just wanted to thank you very much for being here. I mean, uh, so I have an interesting perspective. I've been in the corporate arena. I went back to school and I became a professor of finance in uh, entrepreneurship school. I've quit that job and I'm home homeschooling the classics. And so I kind of have a, a, a balance of where do I stand on it. And one of the challenges in, I want to affirm the classics for anybody that's kind of unsure if you should go in that direction. If you want to study women's studies, you study the classics. You can look how many women writers wrote under another writer just to um, have success. So you want to see, you want to have that as a discussion or, you know, understanding um, what's really going on with, um, you know, ISIS and all of the other things in, in our society go back to Exodus when, you know, the Pharaoh, you know, how many plagues were going to happen. I mean, you can study the classics, you're going to get modern history through it and, um, and understanding how to apply the thought into modern day. Um, I, I mean, we homeschool now, we homeschool through the classics. Um, but one of the challenges that I have is higher education. So I've been in the classroom, I've seen how inadequate our students are. Um, I taught on the quarter system, which you get exactly 11 weeks to teach on the quarter system. By week four, my, my kids wouldn't even be able to um, be up to par in the math to even cope with, um, this is junior and senior, by the way, so not the first two years. They're, they're just not equipped math-wise. But the real question that I have for you is college in general. So I understand if you're going to work for a government, you, you do. You have to check the box that you do, in fact, have a college degree from an accredited university. But I mean, one of the things that my husband and I are really toying with is why have a college degree at all when it has um, you know, some of these negative effects in our society. You have a lot of debt. You have a lot of time wasted rather than going out and getting a job. So, you know, with ACT and thinking about this, why not just create it? Uh, working at MGM Studios, I never looked at if your school was accredited. I have to be honest with you. I didn't hire based on your accreditation of a degree. 
Um, I'm sure the government would look into that if you wanted to go be a fireman or a policeman or some government related, but in the corporate world, I don't think that's true. I know, I live in California, I know Elon Musk, for example, he owns SpaceX, as you know, and his kids, of course, don't go to any schools at all. They, they have a school, and if you homeschool in California and you wanna apply to that school that's not known, to anybody else but in you know certain areas um, you can apply to go there it's free you know he pays for it out of his own pocket but I don't think he sits around and thinks about whether or not his kids are going to go to college so I, I mean the only struggle that I really really have is the Millennials that are in college they've been taught to go to college they've been taught to check off those boxes are gonna hire my kids who I'm raising with don't do that you know, go get a job, get some real life skills, and maybe get a college degree from an Acton. But don't you think corporate America is going to look at your skills? Sure, if you're gonna work for the government, they're not. But if you are going to go into private industry, will it matter if your college is even accredited? And that's kind of my question. Will it matter? Short answer. Who knows? <laughs> uh, I mean, really, uh, are another fellow participant in the audience, Paul, raised some interesting suggestions. Corporate America is maybe is starting to wise up to the fact that this is just a piece of paper that right now, corporate America says, ah, the kids pay for their college. That's $100,000 for this piece of paper, and then we get this information that helps us decide whether to hire them. It doesn't cost us anything, but it does cost businesses, and it costs them dearly. Even though there's been some deterioration, college graduates make nearly double what high school graduates. So they're paying through the nose. They might say, gee, that's a huge differential. Maybe we don't have to pay that differential. Maybe we can pay less. Paul suggested one way uh, of doing this. We'll start our own university. By the way, in uh, G GM, back in their, the glory days of GM, uh, d uh, did a good bit of this. This has been going on for decades. Uh, and there's no reason it can't happen. I don't know that it will happen, but I think it is a model that is increasingly tempting, I would think, for American business. And I'm gonna shut up because I, I know uh, Paul wants to talk. <laughs> Did either of you have anything more? I didn't want to cut you off in the middle. Nope. Okay. No? All right, well thank you very much.